Good afternoon. Beatrice, is that on? Beatrice Saint Laurent has been teaching at Bridgewater State University since 1996 and is professor of art history in the Department of Art and Art History, teaching course courses such as Islamic art and architecture, monuments as cultural symbols and emblems of power, and the history of photography. After receiving her PhD in Islamic Art and Architecture from Harvard University in the Department of the History of Art and Architecture in 1989, she spent two years here at the Albright Institute and one year at the American Center of Oriental Research in Amman. Those three years resulted in publications on the Ottoman restorations of the Dome of the Rock. Her, mo her most recent research focuses on the modern and contemporary restorations of the Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque, and now particularly on the monuments of 7th century early Islamic Jerusalem, including the first mosque of the city, the Dome of the Rock, and the Umayyad administrative center south of the Haram al-Sharif. In 2016, uh, she is the Gittin Distinguished Professor at the Albright, and now, as Senior Associate Fellow, she is currently preparing a book with Khalid Assam Awad, also a Senior Associate Fellow at the Albright, for publication by Equinox Press, entitled, Capitalizing Jerusalem, Moalia's Urban Vision 638 to 680, on the architectural and urban development of early Islamic Jerusalem, specifically under the first Umayyad Caliph, uh, Moalia, with his specific unification his uh, unification of South Arabian and local Jerusalem regional architectural traditions, establishing Jerusalem as one of the regional capitals of Balad Asham. Join me in welcoming Beatrice. colleague who's sitting here in the front row, Issam Awad. Uh, he was the chief architect and conservator of the Haram Sharif monuments. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, former chief architect and conservator of the Haram Sharif for 32 years and also an Albright senior research fellow. A bit of summary of our research on the Haram uh, in the 7th century. In 2012, Hissam approached me with the subject of the Marwani Musala, or Solomon's Stables, or Al Masjid al Qadim, as it was variously known in the 19th century, as possibly the Mosque of Muawiyah, the first Umayyad Amir al Muminin, or Commander of the Faithful. Since then, this project has expanded far beyond my expectations to include a study of Muawiyah and his family's monumental contribution from his days as a scribe of the Prophet ending with his development of Jerusalem as one of the multiple capitals of the nascent Umayyad Empire. <coughs> I'm currently completing an article on his time in the Hejaz in Greater Syria, or Belad Asham, other than Jerusalem, which includes an overview of all the monumental projects attributable to his time in the region. This article will be sent to the Journal of Islamic Archaeology prior to my departure from Jerusalem next Tuesday. I will not be discussing that material today. The grander program is for our book under contract with Equinox, as Megan already said, in, the, in their Islamic Archaeology series entitled Capitalizing Jerusalem, Muawiyah's Urban Vision, um, 638 to 680, and it's due out in December 2019. Today, I will turn my attention to a subject that has not been addressed by us here at the Albright at this point, the Dome of the Rock, who built it, the origins of the building's form and its relationship to both the Quran and other early texts. The subject of utilizing texts for this time period is fraught with difficulty and the subject of a long-standing debate concerning the reliability of these texts. I was introduced to this issue when my PhD advisor at Harvard, Oleg Rabar, in 1979, when I began my program, handed me a copy of Patricia Crone and Michael Cook's 1977 book, Hegelism. 
and the debate continues today, fairly unabated, but not, this is not to be dealt with today in this, in this lecture, but as a chapter of our book. I will be making some references to the difficulties with texts. A few quotes concerning the, the, the biases of, of, will be read later about the biases that appear in the early texts. I'm not going to do that just now. All right, I need to push forward in two places. Does that work? Yeah, okay. Didn't work here. All right. Didn't work here. All right, okay. Where this project began was with the questioning of earlier premises concerning the seventh century, monumental construction on the Haram, or Beit al maqdis as it was once known. Concerning Al-Aqsa Mosque in 1988, Oleg Rabar stated, its peculiarity is that it was open to the north toward the Dome of the Rock and the rest of the Haram to the east. The latter is unusual and is probably explained by the ways in which the Muslim population mostly settled to the south of the Haram, ascended to the holy place. We know that the main accesses to the Haram were through underground passages and the eastern entrances um, of the Aqsa may indicate that the triple gate and the so-called stables of Solomon in the southeastern corner of the Haram played a much greater role in the life of the city than has been believed. And you can see in, the, in this uh, plan that that whole area, oops, I'm still on that. Okay, hang on. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. Something isn't advancing. Yeah, that's, that's the one I'm referring to. Sorry, did I not push this? Uh, sorry. Okay, you can see this whole area on the eastern side is basically been ignored. And the stables are here, and I'll be addressing that. And I'll also mention that part of our project includes attributing at least the beginning of the palace uh, sequence south of the Haram. You're saying that there was something in the ravine? In the ravine, no. The east side of the ravine? No, no, here, uh, the east side of the platform. Oh. Yeah, the east side of the platform. And uh, we're saying also that he possibly began the palaces south of the Haram. I'm not going to deal with that aspect particularly today. All right, so let's see if, let's see if this is working. Yeah, all right. When Hassan asked what I saw when facing the north entrance of the Marwani in, tw in 2012, I eventually responded appropriately that I saw a building that had once been considered underground, but now had to be re-evaluated as buried because of the exposure um, of the multi-arched north entrance that you see here. I'm going to do a brief review of this, but I'm not going to go through the whole thing, uh, the whole process of the mosque. When we then faced the Golden Gate, and my memory says that I asked if the two were at the same level, and the response from Islam was yes. And then I asked, so what was in between? A whole lot of trash is what it turns out to have been. And I have been examining some of that trash, working with the Temple Mount Sifting Project, and grab these in the front row. <laughs> Uh, I've been looking at the tiles. I've been looking at their tiles and discovering the remnants of the kiln that was once in the Crusader building attached to the Aqsa Mosque and demolished in 1943. That became part of the trash that they have been working with. But this area was filled with trash. We're thinking that it's beginning in the Abbasid period after the mosque went out of use, thus determining that the entire eastern part of the platform of the Haram was much lower than earlier thought prompting rethinking of the site on multiple levels. And I think if that would be this whole area. Oh, can't see it. I will go to All right. I'm not advancing. I've got to do two. <laughs> Yell at me, Matt. <laughs> this whole area here is the area we're talking about. This is the Golden Gate, and the Golden Gate is obviously much lower. And this is before the removal of the dirt. Uh, this picture is from 1930s. Uh, so that you can see that this is uh, a whole different view of what that area represented. 
That was my initiation to our first project on the 7th century, determining that the Musala was the mosque of Muawiyah, where in 660-61 he became Amir al muminin the commander of the faithful, as he preferred to be called, in the surviving inscriptions in his name, thus initiating the reign of the Umayyad dynasty in greater Syria of the Radishan. As far as archaeological material evidence on the Haram and excavation, excavation is out of the question in the sacred precinct. There are also no surviving inscriptions from the mosque, which no doubt would have been destroyed by the Abbasids when the building went out of use as a mosque. Those of you that have heard me speak on the mosque before, have patience. I think there's a bunch of people in the room who haven't heard about our initial project, so I'm going to give a brief summary. Our article on the mosque was published in the Jerusalem Quarterly in 2013, and this project has expanded well beyond the limits of either the Mosque of Muawiyah or of Jerusalem as part of the urban vision of Muawiyah in capitalizing Jerusalem. A quick summary, prayer hall and stables, which is here. This is the prayer hall. This is the courtyard of the mosque, extending over as far as the, uh, the bedrock. There was an arcade, a rock, which is here, and the Golden Gate was probably the cer ceremonial entrance, and I'm not going to go into all the implications of this today. That's in the published article. What is going on with this? All right, here we go. Though it may have been finished earlier, we know that it was complete by his investiture as the first Sufyan of Umayyad Caliph. It's a multi-vaulted structure, and this is sort of upside down from the pictures that I showed you of the north entrance. The north entrance is here. This is the prayer hall. There's a, a, a wider fifth aisle and a wider sixth aisle, which I'll address. The fifth is the widest, and thus the central nave, and the sixth is nearly as wide and connected to an exit in the south wall which is the um, single gate. And this is my colleague's plan. All right. Repeating what Gubar said, the population entered through the east and underground passages from the south. This brings us to the triple gate. Its, its, its rebuilding is contemporary with the seventh century rebuilding of the south wall of the mosque and mosque. Its use parallels that of Muawiyah's creation of an open-air prayer space, which you can see above, uh, within the ancient Temenos of, of Damascus. All entered through a triple gate. Oops, and it hasn't been advanced. There's, there's a triple gate here, and if you entered here, this is all open space, and he had a mihrab installed in this wall, and that's where Muslims went to pray. And Christians went to the left to the church of John the Baptist. So we see a common usage of space uh, in this period for the Ahl Kitab, or the people of the book. This also occurred in Jus Jerusalem. Shared spaces by Christians and Muslims. A major topic that I've been working on for the other article, the Mosque of Homs, an open-air mosque, or the church of, uh, Mosque Church of Be'er Ola in the Aragon, the Katizma Church between Jerusalem and Bethlehem are also examples. Also add here that there's a growing body of evidence that Abdul Malik, who resided in Medina before he became caliph, followed Muawiyah at many of the now documented sites attributable to Muawiyah. As you enter the triple vaulted passageway from the south, and I'm cheating here because this image is from the north and it happens to be my best slide of one of the vaulted passages. Um, the Muslims turn to the right into this passageway here to enter the mosque, and others, the other peoples of the book, continued straight through the vaulted passageways to enter the sacred precinct. And here I do mean the other two peoples of the book, Jews and Christians, in a time that was accepting of this position. Waliya is known to have settled the Jews of Tiberias somewhere in the southern area outside the precinct. Truly notable is the near complete absence of decoration on the interior, except for pieces of marble forming a flat arch on the south wall. 
the south part of the, of the fifth central aisle, and that is located right there. The Mirab is said to have been invented by Muawiyah, which points to the direction of Mecca. I'm not going to deal with that topic today, but you can see that that, um, that that's, that area here is represented here. You have a flat arch with over here a large stone, which is a piece of spolia, which you can see here. This is a major topic that should be discussed, but won't be today. <laughs> The single gate, also undecorated, leads to the mosque's sixth aisle and out from the mosque to what was his palace just south of the Haram. With this accomplished, we turned our attention to other projects on the Haram. In May 2016, Michael Burgoyne, author of the major study, Mamluk Jerusalem, spent a brief, brief period working with Isam and I. During his study of Mamluk Jerusalem, he discovered existing Umayyad period stonework indicating that gates shown with the green arrows on the plan existed in the seventh century and probably those shown in red, determining that the footprint of the precinct followed that of the Herodian period during the early Umayyad period. Along the north wall, there was also a triple gate, which I think, can you all read the plan from where you're sitting? Is the tri triple gate was here, and it's now incorporated in the arcade of the uh, Mamluk Madrasa that's there. And there's possibly a double or a second triple gate. Today, the Babalatum and the Babhita. I'll show you um, Babhita here. And here's the original sort of Umayyad period uh, arch looking up under here. In the, pr in the process of examining the walls of the upper platform, I, I ended up looking at the, the arcade, the Mawazin or the Kanatir that goes up the east stairs to the Dome of the Rock. And I noticed something quite unusual in that this whole lower area that forms the arcade, not above here, but all of this on both sides is made up of uh, reused Herodian stone, which was not really used after the, much after the Umayyad period for reconstruction on the Haram. So that this arcade probably dates from this time period in, in the early Umayyad period. Okay, then we started to look at the platform, and um, this area here, let's point it out, the original area of the platform goes this way. And um, my, the Boyne, there is an inscription from the Ayyubid period that said that the platform was expanded by 18 meters. We know it's by 18 meters. And we are now questioning whether it was not smaller in uh, that time period as well because of something that's going on underneath here, which I'm not going to elaborate on today, um, but will be, dis has been discussed. Okay. And I think you can see from this that the entire mosque set up here is, is here. Here's the courtyard in, in slashed green, and here's the prayer, the prayer hall here. Um, triple gate going up to the platform where it could rise up to the uh, side of the Dome of the Rock. Um, the Golden Gate is here, the Rewalk or Arcade. And when working with Michael, he pointed out that there were outcroppings here uh, that included, that showed that there was an arcade that probably ran all the way around. So we have the complete definition of the uh, Umayyad period haram, or Beit al as it was called. Okay, now we go to something else. Now to turn to the Dome of the Rock. First, we need to address an already mentioned difficulty with the use of early text material uh, applied to this period. Much of scholarship relies on the Abbasid and later period texts, which today, accepted by most scholars, has, uh, as having uh, an anti-Umayyad bias. I'm going to do something today that I never do, which is to read a series of quotes. <laughs> from people. Um, I, I don't like doing this in a lecture, but I think it's appropriate under the circumstances. 
propagating the, this is from uh, George C. Miles in 1948, propagating the anti-Umayyad cause, Abbasid traditionalists put into the mouth of the prophet the words, I was sent not for agriculture but for jihad, the holy war. They revealed that Muhammad planted no palms, no dug, no canals, or wells. Such hadith were more useful, or useful propaganda to combat the Umayyad agricultural policies and thus Umayyad sympathies in general. G. Hotting, writing in 1985, 1985 concerning the hadith, tradition expresses its hostility to the dynasty, above all, by insisting that they were merely kings and refusing to recognize them as caliphs. Seeing them as kings in the Byzantine and Sasanian tradition, citing specifically that Muawiyah perverted the caliphate into kingship. From the early history of the monumental development of early Islam, K.A.C. Cresswell and Oleg Gravar, major scholars in my, that discipline, deny both that there existed a tradition of architecture in pre-Islamic Arabia, as well as during the early Islamic period. Cresswell, a major documentation of Islamic art in his 1932 early Muslim architecture states, Arabia at the rise of Islam does not appear to have possessed anything worthy of the name of architecture. Rabar, weighing in on both the debate of textual reliability and on early Islamic art in Arabia, states, it's fairly certain that at least in the period immediately preceding the Muslim conquest, the Arabs of Arabia had very few indigenous traditions of any significance. He continues, any modification of this impression of, of poverty and the artistic development of pre-Islamic Arabia produced by excavations, explorations, and a more systematic study of literary documents is hardly likely to be very significant. I think we're proving that wrong today, but this was the way this discussion began. The situation is changing. In, tw in, tw in 2005, Andrew Peterson states, the settled people of the Mediterranean literal are characterized as civilized people who are either Europeans themselves or who have adopted European, i.e. Hellenistic slash Roman customs. The Nomads, on the other hand, are regarded as uncivilized barbarians intent on looting the towns and villages of the settled people. The overall picture now is generally rejected in favor of a more complex analysis, and I think that's proving true in publications that are coming out about um, Arabian culture prior to Islam and after Islam. With that, I embark on an examination of uh, the Dome of the Rock itself and where it comes from, from eyes and every other eyes. The traditional view is that the octagonal form and interior decoration of the dome was derivative of early Byzantine forerunners in the region, and that is indeed true, but only up to a point. And I'll show you a couple of them. Pardon me for the slide, the image on the left. It's a really bad picture of the Church of the Ascension. There are multiple churches. Well, now, yeah. <laughs> And, um, and I show you the Church of the Katisma, which had uh, both a function as a, uh, as, a, as a church and as a mosque. It has a, a mihrab, which I can, if I can see it, I'm not sure, can somebody point, am I pointing to it? Yeah. And it served at the same time both as a church and as a, a Muslim prayer space. This is between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. Other churches that I could cite would be the Church of Mary Theodicus on Mount Gerizim, um, built on Samaritan ruins, the Church um, of Sip at Sipopolis or Beit Shan, built on Roman ruins, uh, the Octagonal Church of Caesarea. And with that, I turn to the Octagonal Church of Caesarea, which um, the, this is actually a very important site, I think, for Jerusalem. At Caesarea, you have an octagonal church sitting on a Herodian platform, um, which seems to me a very close parallel to what's going on here in Jerusalem. The size of the church is very clearly very close to that of the Dome of the Rock, and if the original size of the high on platform, the upper platform, is smaller than is now, it would be about the same size as the platform in Caesarea. The later conquest of Caesarea by Muawiyah, the, the capital of Palestina Prima, 
Prima, sorry, in 640, affected Nuwari's choices for architectural derivation, demonstrating continuity with earlier political and religious dominion. The idea of a sacred precinct not only linked, is not only linked to the earlier period of the Roman temple and the Herodian precinct in Jerusalem, but it's also tied to the Hejaz in Arabia and further south in Yemen. Yemen and the first, Yemen and the first concept of haram, or the word used there, mahram, which is derived from the same root, and this is a pre-Arabic term from the Soviet of Hemuritic. We know that, in that inscription, this is a Hindu right inscription on the left, published by Christian Robin, here, and I'll show you the map, <laughs> which is self-explanatory. The inscription refers to a sanctuary, or a sacred sanctuary, or mahram. It is the same root word, and it shows up in other palaces, in other sites in, um, in the Hejaz, and in Yemen. It carries over to the two Haramain, al Haramain, the two Harams in Mecca, Medina. Same use of the term. Even though the word was not used um, in Jerusalem to refer to the site in the seventh century, it was called Beit al Maktis in that time period and had other names as well. This connection to the traditions of the South and in the Hejaz and Yemen raised other questions. First, I'll address the interior decoration. The interior mosaics of the Dome of the Rock conform with Byzantine religious architecture and the Eastern Mediterranean Koine. But that decoration also raises a series of questions of attribution and more. And obviously, we've already shown that the form of the building, the octagonal form, mirrors the, the, the uh, octagonal church in the Byzantine tradition. The completion date of the interior mosaic program by 692 is dated by the displayed inscription here, during the reign of the Umayyad Caliph Abdel Malik. Speculation dominates uh, the project's beginning date. Some suggesting 684, 685, or 688, 689, um, during the reign of Abdel Malik and some earlier during the reign of Muawiyah. In fact, there's no factual evidence whatsoever of either the initial patronage, only a supposition due to the completion date, and the date of initiation remaining in the realm of scholarly um, speculation. In his 1988 article, Rabbah has attributed the planning and initiation of the construction of the dome to Muawiyah. With this, we concur. Some of the reasons for an early attribution to Muawiyah, time to construct both the platform and the building, too short, 685 to 692, seven years for such a massive project. Muawiyah was in the region for 46 years and his family even longer prior to Islam. He also had consolidated multi-religious tribal allegiance to himself as the first Umayyad Amir al muminin he built his mosque between 639 and 661, so present in Jerusalem. And we know from the Christian source that the central part of the platform was being cleared in 639. On the other hand, Abdel Malik lived in Medina most of his life, coming to Damascus in 683, two years before he became caliph in 685. And we also know that in other places not to be discussed here, uh, but in our forthcoming article, the Abdel Malik followed Muawiyah to many other sites in the north and along the coast. 685 to 692 is also a period of war and difficulty for the Umayyads. So question the reasonableness for such a date for the dome to be completed in such a short period of time. 
So if the date of inscription, which you see here, com confirms the completion date of the building, building of the dome, small d, does it confirm that he was responsible for the building of the dome, capital D? Did he finish the building, adding the dome to the top, or did he, um, did he add the in some interior decoration? It's really unclear. We don't know specifically. The point of this, even questioning it, um, is that assumptions have been made and on, in on incomplete evidence. So I think this needs to be pursued. For those of you who don't know, the name of, uh, the, name of the building was replaced, and I think you can see it here. There's the, the whole insertion of Al Matmoon, the Abbasid Caliph's name, um, to the place. And, uh, it, it, it actually is it's even deeper than this, and I'll explain a little bit about talking about evidence by moving to this slide, which shows you a pre-restoration version of the, um, of the inscription uh, from the 1960s. That's, that's dated from the 60s. It's the same inscription. But what I want to talk about here is the reliability of what you see. Margaret Van Bersham's 1927 to 28 report, revised in 1963 and published in 69 in her interim report of the 30s, located in, it's in the Mandate Archives of Jerusalem. In the discussions with the Egyptian architect in charge of doing the restoration, made it clear that the inscription of the arcade dated 691, 692 was not defaced at all, but in fact was completely redone. Open quote, the Kufic letters in gold now stand out on a crude, lightish green background, and the character of the Kufic script has been effaced. The architect stated, we have corrected all the faults of orthography and added diacritical marks where they seem to be lacking, forever altering the nature of the early Arabic. The other inscription of 1027, 1028, which documented another restoration, was also replaced. So we have to be very careful when we're looking at this kind of evidence to make sure that we're making the right decisions. When you say redone, you're talking about 360 redone? The, the, no, that's the, that particular, the they decided to do, redo the two inscriptions because the Arabic was incorrect. Of course, Arabic had, a, had changed a great deal from the 7th century to 1961. <laughs> it was now modern Arabic, which was very different. So I raised this as, a, as an issue to, to start asking questions. And I put this in for the call. <laughs> <laughs> Jean-Michel, who has organized the, uh, the whole collection of photographs at the Ecole, is present with us here today. Two major issues yet to be addressed. I know of no early Byzantine church, and I'm, I'm always, I've been always wondering why people haven't addressed these questions. There's no early Byzantine church in the region or elsewhere that had a colorful exterior. The Dome of Iraq was not always covered with tiles, but it was also colorful at the time of its creation, covered with flat slabs of marble and colorful mosaics on the exterior. This subject has never been fully addressed. I also know of no Byzantine church that has four entrances from the cardinal points. And nobody has really ventured forward on this. I'm going to address the issue of color first. As late as the 15, is 1552, the mosaics were still intact on the exterior, the lower exterior. Pantaleo uh, was, was a Portuguese traveler in 1593 chronicles a 1552 visit to the Dome of the Rock, stating that it is from the ground to the middle covered with large slabs all in a piece. Polished of finest marble from the middle upwards to the first molding to the top is all of the richest mosaic with many designs of branches, roses, and other beautiful flowers, suggesting the condition of the octagon were in good shape. Those of the drum had already, been dis already disappeared in 1545, as documented by Van Bersham. So what was there? This is during the restoration of 1961. And you see this fellow standing at the top, pointing upward. Oops, there's my... But he's pointing upward, and I'm going to show you some uh, bits and pieces. 
He's pointing to this little area up in the corner here. It shows you some mosaic bits. And can everybody see the mosaic bit here? So you know the exterior you have the mosaics up on the top. Where, where, where is it exactly? It's under the, under the, uh, under the dome. The dome, yeah, right there near the dome, yeah. Under the woodland dome, the, the, the inner dome? Not inside, outside. Oh, outside. outside, the outside covering of mosaics. They also appear by the windows, under the windows, and we have a bit here that shows one of those pieces. And I have another to show you here which is, I think, clear. I'm not sure where this one is. I haven't figured out exactly where on the building. It's by, it's by one of the windows. And I have a bit that survives in the museum that were found during that excavation, excavation restoration. Oops, did I go, there it is, okay. So we have a few pieces that survive in the Islamic Museum at the home. And I compare the two. All right, so a bunch of slides. <coughs> Color needs to be explored from several perspectives. In 1993, Nuhahuri equates the Dome of the Rock with another mythologized palace structure of South Arabian origin called a mihrab, a spatially enclosed sanctuary not to be confused with the niche in the Qibla wall of a mosque. These palaces became part of early Islamic history as symbols of Arab kingship. Notable among these um, women palaces was the Sabian royal palace of Gundan in Sana'a in Yemen. A square structure with four entrances from the cardinal points and a colorful exterior perhaps covered by a dome with its ruins attached to the Prophet's mosque in Sana'a, thus linking the symbol of Arab kingship with the mosque. There are Quranic descriptions of David and Solomon's maharib, the plural of mihrab, in the temple. The latter were associated with Sheba and Yemeni palaces of Biklis, uh, were part of the cultural koine of Islam in the seven, in seventh century Arabia and Yemen. Further, also in the Quran, Mary lived in a mihrab in the temple in Jerusalem for 12 years. We also know but there are references to the exterior of the temple in Jerusalem, uh, the temple as being colorful. And I have Aaron Kohler to thank for referring me to Stephen Fine's article discussing this issue. Thus, this blend of references to the Jewish temple, the Christian reference to it as Mary's residence, and the imperial Arab historical past are made in manifest in the Dome of the Rock built within the temple's sacred precinct in Jerusalem. Yemeni scholar Ubaid ibn Shariah's book on the history of the pre-Islamic Arab kings is presented as a dialogue between Muawiyah and Ubaid. He lived at the court of Muawiyah. Towards the end of the history on the ancient kings, Muawiyah proclaims, um, no, Ubaid proclaims that Himyar's rule had been transferred by the prophet to a new dynasty, the Umayyads. Muawiyah in 660 61 consolidated the southern re regions of Arabia right after becoming caliph or Amir al Muminin in Jerusalem. Shortly after Ali's death, Muawiyah rid Sana'a of the party of Ali, established the rule of the Umayyad dynasty, subsequently installing his brother Uqba ibn Abi Sufyan as the second Umayyad governor of Sana'a. It, it's also of interest to note that the Arab population that moved to Jerusalem were primarily Yemenis. In conclusion, thus there are links of the Dome of the Rock to both the religious, cultural, and architectural legacies of the Judaic, Early Byzantine, Christian, Eastern Mediterranean, Sabio-Himuritic, South Arabian traditions. 
<laughs> <Never be, laughs> controversy. <laughs> there may never be clarity as to the roles of Mwaiwe and Abdel Malik in the construction of the Dome of the Rock. What has become clearer is that there are many more reasons today to state that Mwaiwe, in all probability, at least began construction of the building, and that is it is reflected in this new interpretation of the building's meaning. Citing the Quran whether they are the ones who believe in the Arabian prophet, or whether they are Jews, Christians, or Sabians, often referred to as con converts to Islam, all who believe in Allah and the last day and do righteous deeds, their reward is surely secure with their Lord. They need have no fear, nor shall they grieve. The symbolic association of Solomon, David, and Mary with the temple suggests that Mariah's goal in building the Dome of the Rock in the sacred precinct of Beit al -Maktis was to effectively unify the three religions of the book, and thus the three peoples of the book, the Ahl of Kitab, with the legacy of the pre-Islamic Arabs in a singular monumental mihrab, or sanctuary, glorifying and testifying to that unity under the sovereignty of Islam. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you very much, Beatrice. Mm -hmm. uh, will you take questions? Of course. Good, I'll ask you to please use the microphone so we'll pass it around. Uh, you, said at, you said at the beginning that uh, you don't know of any other church that had four entrances in the cardinal. Right, uh, I don't know of any. Why would you expect to find that kind of a Byzantine church? I wouldn't, yes. but if it's being used as a model, for the Dome of the Rock, I would expect the Dome of the Rock to have one entrance if it's totally based on a Byzantine church plan. But it wasn't built as a church or as a ma mosque. It was no, no. As a monument. I'm, I'm fully aware. I'm fully aware of that. Yes, I think that the issue is you have a building. If it's using solely a Byzantine pl model and plan, you would expect it to have one entrance. It doesn't, it has four, and nobody's really questioned what, that, what the implications of that are and where that comes from. There had to be another source for, for applying it to the building. Couldn't it be just something new? It could, but it's not likely. <laughs> Thanks, that was very good. Thank you. But uh, uh, Matthew, I have to confess, I was surprised that during Ramadan and with this lecture, you had the uh, wine. You should have had single malt. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a, an interesting uh, uh, point that you you uh, showed that on the uh, compound there, there was a church and a mosque together. Not up there. That was at Caesarea. Well, oh, no, 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 Maybe that will return one day. Inshallah. <laughs> I just want to thank you. That was awesome. Um, what I really loved about it uh, is the ver is the mixture of the different features. You should uh, take a look at some of the work that Philip Stockhammer's done on entanglement theory. I think you'd find it uh, hmm. uh, really giving an extra dimension. We've we've used it to look at the uh, Philistines as well, and the various, and tease out the different cultural um, aspects of their mm -hmm. culture. Um, so yeah, congratulations. Thanks. Pass that over to Steve. That was great, Beatrice. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm th excuse me, I studied Western art history. And so, um, <laughs> so I, immediately I. <laughs> I immediately jumped to Stato Stefano Rotondo. Ah, yeah, through, okay. and through the Krauthammer eyes mm -hmm. with its four bays and its arch and its assumption that it's drawing from the Holy Sepulchre onto Rome mm -hmm. as, as a place to look for uh, that four-sided entrance. Okay. 
I was just thinking out loud. In the That's pretty far away. Yeah, but if Krautheimer's right, which sometimes he is and sometimes he's not, mm. right. then, um, <laughs> because you know, the assumption is that Santo Stefano then moved north into Dijon and other places later on, mm -hmm. right, through the column numbers and the arches and all of that. Right. Uh, in, the, in the Roman Empire, especially the Christian Roman Empire, Jerusalem and Ravenna and Rome weren't that far apart. Correct, but I, most of the models I think that we're looking at for the dome were probably regional. I'm sure it's regional, yeah, yeah. but I'm wondering the well. but the building doesn't exist anymore regionally. Uh, right. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. You know, there's the stuff in the outlying district that refers back. Ah, uh, okay. But it's still Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for the most uh, illuminating uh, lecture you Thanks, gave us. <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, pictures you showed of the outer mosaics of the Dome of the Rock, mm -hmm. where are they from? The archive archives, thanks to my colleague. Because <laughs> they were never published as far as I they're not. <laughs> they're uh, not published. Uh, we have in the uh, Sifting project, right. a very, very large number right, of mosaic Greek <laughs> cubes right. or tesserae from those outer mosaics. Um, we uh, have them by the thousands, and uh, they, many of them are gilded. Right. And they could be from the interior of the Aqsa, too, as well, with the restoration, am I correct? That is possible. That is possible. But it's gilding from outside. Okay. So it could be both, yep. Uh, that is very much possible, mm -hmm. but I still assume that uh, the uh, major source could be the uh, Dome of the Rock alone. Okay. Uh, nevertheless, we started just now uh, uh, looking at these uh, mosaics, and uh, uh, I hope in the future to come up with uh, some, some ideas as to whether we can suggest any pattern or anything. Good. Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions, comments? Go to Katia and then back here. Thank you, Beatrice. Yeah. Uh -huh. I just would like to make an observation. I, I do appreciate and especially keeping our minds open. Mm -hmm. And um, I have no doubt there is much more into Moalia's doings that we know from the archaeological and architectural uh, evidence. Um, I just feel that we have to be extra careful because it is true that lots of the later material might be biased um, towards the Umayyads, but there is one thing that we do have evidence, the little literary evidence that we have concerning the um, construction, the erection of the Dome of the Rock, reasons for building it, going hallways, um, they relate to Abdelmalek. So we have to be careful. Those are later sources. Later sources, yes. but the same later sources, they don't, re they don't uh, relate to Moawiya. But Moawiya was the most mm -hmm. reviled by the Abbasids. I think, I think we have to be um, careful. I'm not saying that it's impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, this um, uh, possibility has been raised already in the 1950s by Goitain and has been raised by uh, Francis Peters in 1983 and, mm -hmm. and Oleg Rabar. So uh, there is a point because Moawiya was a very important caliph and he brought the uh, importance of Jerusalem uh, central but I think methodologically we have to be still very very careful not to turn modern scholars into transmitters historical transmitters we have to be very careful with that, that has of, already uh, happened. Uh, we have to we have to be careful <laughs> of using already um, theses by Grabar 
and by others. For instance, I agreed with the point in what uh, you were telling about Caesarea, and this has, that has been already commented by Donald Whitcomb about the yes. similarity and what's between Caesarea, Caesarea and what's happening in the Temple Mount. So I'm not saying that it's impossible. But I, I just think we have to be extra careful because otherwise we'll be doing to Abdel Malik's history. Uh, also, we're going to be perhaps uh, distorting a little bit of what we know about that period. So we want so much to know about Moaya. We know something about Abdul Malik's time, and it's not really Abdul Malik's time. It's Abdul Malik's time through Al Walid's time, which we do have evidence from Damascus. And Dome of the Rock and Damascus, they do have, they do uh, make quite a, a duo. So. I'm just saying let's keep being very, very uh, careful not to be too willing to see Moawiya's uh, architectural deeds where we still don't really have uh, um, a serious um, material well, evidence. Our, our article that I'm sending in on the area outside of Jerusalem deals with a lot of this material. We know that Abdel Malik followed Moawiya to many sites including the, the uh, Palace of Sinabra. Sinabra. It's also cited that he built fortresses on the coast, and there's Umayyad remains in Ashtadyan, the fortress, and up north. But you see now you're using the same but sources that uh, I think it's some, it of, some of what's going on here is the difference between the art historian and the archaeologist. Mm -hmm. And I think the conversation does need to take place between mm -hmm. the art historian and the archaeologist. Mm -hmm. Archaeologist is less willing to make a commitment. The art historian, I think, more willing. <laughs> but here it's uh, uh, archaeologist who was also dealing with, uh, with the background in the Middle Eastern history. So, uh, and I too. So, so, so I know. I, I, Beatrice, don't take me wrong. No, I, 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 I think there is a possibility. I'm just saying that uh, we should keep being very, very careful with that. We are Perfect. creating uh, perhaps a myth uh, about Moria. Thank you. <coughs> Um, I had a question about the reconstruction of the earliest mosque with this huge courtyard going all the way to the, to the gate. Yes. Uh, how should I envision the use of this courtyard and is, does this create... As any courtyard of a mosque. Okay. And does this create sort of a, a, cut, uh, sort of a, as a separate compound within the compound or, or does this to integrate... To some extent, to yes. I mean, it, it creates the space of the mosque leading to the mosque, the ceremonial entrance being... Uh, leading into, you know, from the Golden Gate into the prayer space, the north entrance, the, which was the main entrance. So that's separated from the rest of the... Of the yeah, which was probably still pretty much un in ruins beyond, I mean, when they arrived, yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's time for another question, if anyone wants. Great. You're all welcome to stay for food and drink, and thanks for coming. Thanks, Beatrice. Thank you.